Hello, it's Peter Mayer, and I'm really excited that we're going to be spending some time talking to Donald Zeraldo. He is considered one of the founding fathers of premium wine in Canada. In 1974, he began his adventures that led to Inniskill to him winning the most prized medal for wine, putting Canada ice wine, putting Canada on the map. And in 1998, Don ended up getting the most coveted award, joining the Order of Canada. And I met Don because we were at Reds at the bottom of the first Canadian place. And I was introduced to him by his partners in a winery he was involved in in Portugal. And I couldn't get my eye off his lapel because he had the Order of Canada. And we became friends after that. And he was so generous. He brought me to his winery, which he has his own winery after he went into semi-retirement, which is not working 150 hours a week, but 60. I want to thank you so much, Don, for joining with me. And I hope I did honor to your story. But over the next hour, I'd love to capture it because I think that a life well lived and you are a perfect example of someone who's lived a full life. Peter, thank you. I, uh, I recall, honestly, I recall our first meeting over your book that you wrote. I can't refresh my memory on the title. The King of Main Street was on mentorship. That's right. That's right. And I read it and I, as you know, I, I'd said to you that my uh, passion right now is to be mentoring young people, primarily in the wine business, but also in other fields where I've, you know, gained some knowledge and experience. And I think it's an obligation for people like ourselves who have, you know, spent great life, had great opportunities to meet extraordinary individuals and we really need to download all of that knowledge and I'm sure someday we'll be able to do it with a chip but in the meantime uh, we'll do it verbally or by experience helping young people because I, I do it also because I remember when I was getting started as you mentioned uh, starting in Eskillen which is the first wine license in Canada since prohibition I had a lot of people that really supported me. I also had a lot of people who thought I was crazy, but I never forget the ones that supported me. And oftentimes when I was stuck or I was in a situation, I would go back to them and ask for advice. And they were always, you know, uh, leading individuals. I think the term is, you know, standing on the shoulders of great people. Uh, you can see a lot farther. Yes. Well, how did you decide to get into wine? Like, like, how old were you when you decided <laughs> that I want to become uh, someone who creates wine? And just a question, your, your name happens to be Italian. So I'm going to ask a question. Do you come from a family that would make their own wine? Of course. I mean, I come from a region called Friuli, just north of Venice. So, you know, it's wine country. It's known for its... Uh, Picolit, which is not widely known, is a very indigenous old variety. Uh, Pinot Grigio comes from there. And more recently, Prosecco, which, by the way, I happen to have just acquired a Prosecco vineyard. But how I got started, my, you know, of course, my dad made wine at home. Uh, I, he died when I was 15, uh, unfortunately. So I suppose, you know, I drank wine early. You know, we have the privilege of being given wine when we're young, so we learn how to uh, manage it. The really uh, situation that occurred uh, to get me in the wine business, I was in the nursery business. I was growing uh, grapevines, fruit trees, and at that time, no ornamentals. But this guy named Carl Kaiser had married a Canadian, come to Canada, uh, he'd studied in a monastery in St. Veit in Austria. So I, he learned to trade there. But when he came to Canada um, and married, he wanted to make some wine. But he didn't want the Canadian tasting Vitis Labrusca, which is Concord, Niagara, baby duck stuff. <laughs> and that's, you know, so he said, do you have something, you know, because he was told I had these uh, hybrid vines. 
So I, he took the vine, brought back a bottle of wine. I was so blown away by the wine. I said, well, who made this? He said, I did. I said, this is really good. And he probably jokingly said, well, why don't I make it and you sell it? And I said, well, this is liquor board. This is Ontario, Canada. It's controlled by the Liquor Control Board of Ontario. Uh, and, and in your country, in the United States, it's Pennsylvania's got the equivalent liquor board. And really, that's how innocently it started. And uh, I went to the liquor board to ask for a license or a permit. Basically, the vice president, some guy behind a big desk, kind of chuckled and basically threw me out. And three months later, I got a letter from an individual came general called General George Kitching. And when you talk about mentoring, he's the first man that mentored me, tall, general in the British Armed Forces that fought in the Second World War. And he said, you know, we drank a lot of great wine when I was in the army in Europe during the war. I, you know, they probably stole it from the Italians and the, and the French. And uh, he sort of said, like, to hear what you've got to say. And honestly, that's really uh, what gave me the, the passion and the focus, because he guided us through this whole thing until we got the license in uh, 1975. And you were the first winery in Niagara region? Since Prohibition. Oh, there were wineries here. It was Jordan, Chateau Gay, Brights. But, you know, they made, you know, pop wines and they made old ports and sherries. And, you know, Canadian wine, honestly, well, you know, it was a bit of a joke back then. So well, I, I wasn't wine... of age to drink back then. So I was a piss you <laughs> <Yeah>. with <winning. laughs> Well, you were drinking. Well, you were at university. You were drinking something. I don't know what it was. Right. And, and I, so... love wine. I love wine. No, I listen, it's, it's, it, and me, for me, it's part of the culture because, you know, we Italians think of wine as part of the uh, setting at the table. It's not an alcoholic beverage. Unfortunately, the Quakers who settled in North America, sex, wine or alcohol, wine, and I don't know what else is not good for you. But, you know, as an Italian, I don't buy that story. So <laughs> of any of those commodities. So, you know, it's part of the culture. And and it's really an evolution in local cuisine, too, because there, you know, that when you go to Europe or Italy or wherever, you know, the local wine matches the local food. And that's how it evolved. And here we have the opportunity, both in Canada and the United States, to have a vast array of wines from all over the world. And it becomes sort of a very fascinating uh, hobby, pastime. I'm sure you have a wine cellar like most I have a question to ask about the Niagara region because a lot of people are going to be listening are Americans, so they think of Niagara Falls because that's the Niagara region. I remember taking tours and they would share that there was a unique microclimate that was only specific or very specific to that region because of the geography, maybe the, the Niagara escarpment. Can you just share with me like what made the Niagara region a place where you could grow grapes that could be turned into wine that would be crowned the best wine in the world? Sure. I mean, the region itself is the Niagara Peninsula between Lake Erie and Lake Ontario. Niagara Falls empties from Lake Erie into Lake Ontario, and that's Niagara Falls. The Niagara Escarpment that you mentioned is one of the boundaries that creates that microclimate. Niagara Falls 12,000 years ago was right on that escarpment and it carved its way all the way back to what is now Niagara Falls. So that escarpment, which is about a hundred meters high and Lake Ontario, which is one of the deepest of the five Great Lakes in the five Great Lakes, that microclimate is what allows us to grow grapes because of the conditions and the geography. The best way to explain it is if you go to my website, zeraldo.ca under book scroll down you go to electronic version and you can get a copy of my book for free if you put in where it says uh discount you put in the word vidal v-i-d-a-l to come back to later because that's how we make one of our ice wines from the vidal grape it's a variety 
and it'll give you a free copy of my book called Ice Wine Extreme Winemaking. It'll tell you everything about you wanted to know about Canada, winemaking, the region, and it's focused on ice wine. So that microclimate, and the reason it seemed apparent to me that we could grow the European varieties, which are called Vitis vinifera, Vitis vinifera is Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, Riesling, was because when I went to Germany and Switzerland and Austria with Carl, because we you know, researched this whole thing, my experience in growing grapes and fruit on the farm was limited. And going to Europe, I noticed that Germany doesn't have peach trees and Austria doesn't have many apricot trees other than very selected locations. And yet here in Niagara, we're going peaches, apricots, pears. I thought we should be able to grow these grapes. So it was just a question of management and we are a cool climate viticultural area. So it's marginal for red wines. It's getting better with global warming somewhat. However, we're blessed with cold weather because it does get cold. And in the book, you'll see that the shoulder seasons, which are generally much warmer in California, Burgundy, Italy, all the warm regions in the world where they grow grapes, our temperatures drop off very suddenly. Like right now, I'm looking out the window. It's cold. It's damp. It's not very uh, promising for Pinot Noir in particular, even though it's similar to Burgundy. But in about six weeks, it'll get really cold. We leave the grapes on the vine. They freeze, and then we pick them at minus 10 Celsius. The uh, region here, which was considered too cold to grow Vita Zunifera, which is the Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, for example, when we traveled through Europe, Carl and I traveled to, you know, learn from the experts in France and Italy who were amazingly cooperative in sharing their information. I saw peach trees in Italy, but I didn't see any peach trees in Switzerland or in Germany. And I thought, well, if we can grow peach trees and apricots, then we should be able to grow these European varieties. So because I was in the nursery business, I brought in a lot of plant material from a place called Rauschedo in Italy. That's a huge co-op in a town that does 60 million grafted grapevines. Also, wow. the German Wine Institute in Geisenheim, who uh, were, again, very cooperative to assist us. And so we started, and I remember when I had 30,000 grafted grapevines, Chardonnay, Gamay Noir, and Riesling, couldn't sell them. Nursery, uh, the farmer said, you crazy? They don't grow here in this country. So I had to buy a farm, plant 30,000 vines, and you know, put my money where my mouth was. It wasn't easy because we had to learn how to do it, totally different from the husbandry that existed. But the thing that did help was we had a lot of German immigrants come to the wine region here in Niagara, and they knew how to grow Riesling. And they'd moved here because it's a, a Mennonite region, uh, German Mennonites. And they said, yeah, sure, we absolutely, we can grow them. So with a few selected growers, the Seegers, the Shulas, the Reifs, and my partner, Kaiser, uh, we proceeded uh, against all the skeptics. And from a business point of view, one lesson to learn is, you know, if you sneak up on the big guys and they think you're crazy, you get too far down the road. By the time they figured out what we were doing, well, it was too late for them. And then they all caught on and now they're all doing what we did. Uh, they were researching it, but never made it commercial. Uh, we took it commercial, and as they say, the rest is history on the table wine. And then we discovered the ice wine, which you mentioned, which is really what took us in, in the international stage. Share with how that came about. Well, it was a funny story because uh, uh, Carl asked me to leave some grapes to freeze on the vine. I'm like... Carly, you crazy? Like, what, have you been drinking too much of your own wine? <laughs> and he said, no, we do it in Austria and Germany. And he said, I'd like to try it. I said, fine, we'll leave a few. So we left 13 rows, uh, literally in the driveway as you come in the new winery, which we built in 78. In uh, December the 3rd, 1983, I never forget, I came in the office and I walked in to say hi to Carl and he goes, Donald, I told you not to pick those grapes. I said, Carl, I didn't pick them. I thought you picked them. He said, no, I said, I, I didn't pick them. So we walked outside to 
take a look, they're all gone. Nothing, not one berry left of 13 rows. It had snowed about a foot, you know, half a meter of snow the night before. And the birds, which are starlings that don't go south in the winter, had eaten every single berry. So there was no 1983 vintage. And he called his buddies in Austria and they said, yeah, Carl, you got to put netting on how the birds eat it. So 84 was our first vintage of ice wine. And that's really when it all began. But not until 1991, when a young man uh, who was my import division manager, Frank Pironi, said, Donald, whenever I go home to France, I bring these ice wines and they go, people go crazy. They can't make it in France, can't make it in Italy, can't make it in California. So he said, you should take it to the competition, which is called Vin Expo. Every two years it happens in Bordeaux, France. I did, thinking, wow, I'm going to take Canadian wine to France? Are you kidding me? <laughs> we did and we won a gold medal. But then the second tier of the award was the best of each category, selected by the gurus or professors at the uh, University of Bordeaux, sort of the mecca for wine research. And they picked the 1989 Inniskill and Ice Wine Vidal, made from Vidal grapes, as the best dessert wine in the world. That was it. It was like winning the Olympics and the Academy Awards. I made sure, because it was my job to do the marketing, that the world found out. I got a photographer and took a picture of me getting the award and made sure that the whole world heard about it. And then from there, it was just, we never looked back. You know, it's sort of funny because I always joke, it's, I call it the 100 mile rule. You got to go further away from home to get more respect. <laughs> and unfortunately, as Canadians, you haven't really made it until someone else actually says what you're doing is good. And then at that point, we all take pride. Like we all take pride. Like we have the best wine in the world because someone else told us. My taste buds can't tell me. Someone else has to tell me. But listen, you know, Canada, as I regrettably have to say, I, I go down the list. How about Drake, Celine Dion, Wayne Gretzky, uh, Jim Carrey, I mean, you go down everywhere. As soon as those individuals moved outside of Canada, went to either Vegas or LA to play hockey or Drake, who's now, I understand, the top streaming artist, that's what happens. And then oddly enough, sometimes, you know, people claim that they're American until we Canadians say, no, 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 these, these are real Canadians. And uh, they like it proudly are Canadian, but it's, an, it's because we're such nice people. Everybody thinks, you know, Canadians are really nice. And it's a, it works in our favor that way. But when it comes to business, we are uh, risk averse, I think. That's a statement I think I can make. You're in the market, you know, in the financial markets and not easy raising venture capital in Canada. Not tough. It's, it's not. However, there are certain benefits, which I would actually say came about with the immigration of Canada, because unlike in the U.S., there's a point system, so there's a really been a high quality of immigrants. And I know a, a good friend of mine, he was involved in a company that kept on expanding and they needed to get more people in the network. And he outpaced everybody who was in the US just because there were people from everywhere. And it's a very cohesive country. You know, people are polite, people are nice, you know, and, I will say this, until 2017, I thought Canada had the best regime for taxation for small businesses in the world. And then the current PM did some tinkering that wasn't so great for business. However, you know, Canada, you know, really does grow superstars but sometimes like you know because you're you know you've been involved in farming you've got to sometimes take it out of a small pot and put it into a bigger pot yeah. to fully you know fully bloom and meet its potential well it's interesting to watch because you know in 208 when the crash happened since that day toronto has just exploded as a financial hub you know it's got a lot of technology i mean this guy hinton who invented deep learning that you know is the basis of google's uh, translations and many other things. So people like that, you know, they, they become world renowned. But like you say, I mean, how many people know Hinton because he's a Canadian, he's a professor at U of T 
And there's many examples like that. You know, you go Frank Stronach from uh, Magna International, huge multinational, multi, you know, global company. Uh, he's Canadian, proud of it. Came from Austria, like you said, strong immigrants. There's a lot of examples. The developers in Toronto built those little cities. They're literally all Italians that came from my northern region in Italy, the Tridels and the Dels Autos. And so, yeah, it, it's very, very powerful. Um, politics will stay away from that. I, here's something for you to digest. I uh, spoke at a democracy summit, which is called The Citizen. And myself and this guy, um, Murray Simser, who is a Microsoft executive, moved to Canada. We met each other in a tech company. And uh, my pitch, are you ready for this one? My pitch to the group, and Frank Stronach was a speaker as well. Uh, so was Sergio Marchi, the Minister of Trade. Um, I am propo proposing and trying to write a thesis for the last 10 years. So maybe some of your very astute listeners. The title is Government Without Political Parties. <laughs> that would actually have a government without politicians. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got you got to have politicians. It's just a question of you know, are they elected to serve society, or are they elected to serve their particular party? And I can tell you that you know, watching uh, the entertainment on television that is called news from the U.S. I mean, it can't get any more polarized than it is right now in the United States. It's pretty scary. It is. You know, I, I had a very interesting experience, and then I want to focus more on your, like your experiences. But when I was in student government, I was on the executive of the student council, and I had my fill of having to not have an opinion and having to be very politically correct I didn't I don't know if that was a word back then when I was in university <laughs> and I, I realized something um, I was VP external for two years so we went you know dealing with politicians and everything and most of my colleagues a lot of them went into politics some of them are in government right now and I gotta share with you what I observed and this is why I like being an entrepreneur I like actually choosing who I work with no one can tell me who I'm going to play with like I want to talk to you Donald I don't have to go through anyone to get permission to talk to you. And that's been my entire life. But what I came to the understanding in politics, there's really two distinct personalities. Betas, people who follow, people who say the right things, but they have no backbone. And then you have the psychopaths, the ones who will say the right things, act proper, and when you're not looking, there's something psychologically wrong with them. And I've and 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 somebody I was involved in student politics became quite uh, famous, and he blew up in 2014. Uh, and he was he was a household name in Canada. And when they started going back through his history, they were able to identify whether he was a psychopath. He did have some major flaws, so that's why I like being an entrepreneur because I choose who I play with. Peter, don't you think I mean, that happens to corporations as well? I think we've seen that with a number of examples. So it happens to a lot of people. And I think that's why integrity is so fundamental to anybody, whether you're in business or in politics. And I think we're, we, we've lost touch with that. You know, I was told at the summit conference uh, by a colleague who was speaking that the differential between the average wage earner from 1978, which is coincidentally when I built in a skill in the new winery, Till now, there's been an 18% increase average for a worker, and there's over a 3,000% increase in CEOs of corporations. And, you know, there's a number of, uh, I forget the French uh, economist who wrote a book recently about the uh, equity disparity in wages and so on. So, and I think those kinds of things are because of people like you talk about, some of them just I don't know what it is that drives them, but uh, you call them psychopaths or whatever. And I think we need to get back to being a more equitable society. And business is a good place to start because you know people have to work for a living. 
Well, the reason I like I'm excited about your story is when I was writing my book, The King of Main Street, the reason I called it The King of Main Street, I didn't call it The King of Wall Street or The King of Bay Street for Canadians. It's equivalent to Wall Street. I know I have to keep on doing the translation for Americans, like restroom and bathroom in Canada, we call washroom. The reason I called it The King of Main Street, because that is where the economy lies. It's men and women who, similar to yourself, Don, where you had an idea, you did something that everyone thought you were a stupid lunatic, you did it anyway, you did it in a part of the world that no one knew about, and, you know, you win an award where you become, you know, you created the best wine, after dinner wine, in the world. And it started off from a an idea where you were working alone and then at that point it grew and my question is this when it when it grew how did you handle from being like a small entrepreneur to someone who became the head of a really like you were running at what point how many wineries 14 around the world we had you know kim crawford rh phillips all over the world and i'll tell you it's really easy to answer that question i hired people smarter than me especially in the accounting field I'm not big. I'm a farmer. I'm not big on numbers. So I hired very smart people and they make me look good. Now, why some CEOs can't get that? It's like silly because, you know, as I grew, I can't, I can't do everything, but I knew that I could hire really young uh, people with, and I give them a bit of direction. So they fail. You know, you get two chances. You fail the third time. I'm going to suggest you get another job because you're obviously not in the right place. But I think that's really the secret to my success, having a great partner. He made the wine. Uh, I sold it. And, you know, there's a, a Zen diagram that I love to always refer to. It's two circles and where they intersect. Carl and I intersected occasionally. We used to fight a lot. You know, I'd tell him I couldn't sell this wine because it wasn't up to standard and he'd get all mad. And then he'd tell me, how come you're not selling more wine? Because I'm making it faster that you can sell it. But we each did our job as a specialist. I love marketing. I love public relations. I'm really on a learning curve with social media. Like what we're doing right now didn't exist when I started. I'm going to send out a, a release on this uh, release of the ice wine along with the Prosecco uh, from Italy. And I can now reach people all over the world with a simple click of the button on MailChimp or whatever else you use. I remember when you had to print the press release, photocopy it, stuff it in an envelope, put a stamp on the envelope, et cetera, et cetera. It had to cost you five, 10 bucks of an envelope. Now, what is it, a penny? I think they charge you for MailChimp to do that. Or you can do it yourself if you're you know, savvy. So I think that's a, a, an interesting change in the global environment. And I know that this whole social media is causing great unrest for a lot of people, but you know, there's always negative and positive. And so I try to focus on the silver lining, even in COVID, you know, COVID really enforced this whole thing that we're doing right now. I mean, how many times have you been on a call like this before COVID, you know, not often, right? I, I think very rarely, I think I tried it a little in the early 2000s and that was it. And then I think my first real Zoom call where I was speaking to someone was probably on June. I know the date. It was June 14th, uh, 2020. I was in Toronto and there was an individual I wanted to call. And he said, let's do a Zoom. <laughs> and I said, OK. And I, you know, I had to figure it out. I had to join it. I, had to, I didn't know really what it was. And so it's the world has definitely changed, but at the same time, I like being old fashioned. I want to just share with this story. And again, I think the fact that you were in wine, like unless you're a lush and you drink by yourself, wine's something you share with people, right? Like you're like a cause of like, hey, 
Don, I got this great bottle. Let's get together and break it together and drink it. And we share stories. It's like, it's something that brings human beings together. And I believe right now, the problem with technology is a lot of people are able to escape from something that we were evolved to being social beings. So I wanna share with you a really interesting story. Uh, I was in San Diego and I'm walking around downtown and I walk into a hotel and I see that there's a big conference for an organization called Vistage. It used to be known as the executive committee. And it's the, the join that organization, you need a business that does at least $5 million worth of volume and has a certain amount of employees. And I said, you know, my book, The King of Main Street is perfect for this organization. So I went to the dollar store and I buy a package of eight thank you cards and I ended up getting eight bubble and I said I'm just going to go and write a little note and my chicken scratch hasn't changed since grade four and I sent out four to that organization and then what I did is I sent out another four because I still had four thank yous I sent it out to the executive of YPO Young Presence Organization I don't know if you're familiar with that organization sure. Sure. And I ended up getting a call from the international president of the YPO. And he says, I don't even know how I got a hold of your book. He says, well, I get anywhere from 20 to 80 books sent to me a month, but usually they don't make it to me. But maybe because it was, it was handwritten, like the envelope, and it's a, a Toronto address. Even though I was living in San Diego, I didn't know my address. So I kept like, using my mother's, that I knew. And he said, I opened it up and I read the card and it was handwritten or printed in my chicken scratch. And he probably after a few lines figured out I wasn't five years old <laughs> from the looks of my writing. And he ended up reading my half my book in one sitting and he called me. And the thing that actually struck me is it was something that was old school was new school because so often people are inundated with emails and technology and things like that. And I, I went back to something that was old school and I was able to get to someone personal. And I think, not that I think, I know the industry that you created, the end coin has gotten so much enjoyment and more than the enjoyment, it's created people to come together. Really, the wine might, it's just something that brings people, the wine is good but what, it's, what it creates. And share with me about the gratification you get from knowing about how much people getting together you've actually been a part of. My family is Italian. So I remember going up as a kid, there was always people at the table. And we're not talking four people. We're talking 10, 20, 30, you know, all the bricklayers and the guys that came from Italy that my dad signed the immigration papers and then they all became builders now they're all billionaires in toronto but everybody was always sitting around we were drinking wine great food especially on a sunday and so you're very right and that you know and, and that's very much the culture everybody that goes to italy sees this and they think oh and there's the movies with you know the mama cooking the pasta and the dad brings the wine i look at the technology as a tool so that yeah you still want to do that during covid you couldn't so what I did, just to give you an example how useful the tool of technology is, even though it separates us, I was asked by a sommelier in India, a Canadian kid who went to India to be a sommelier, worked for one of these big uh, five-star chains. He said, oh, would you mind doing a, a master class with my students in India? I'm like, yeah, sure. I said, you know, there's an issue there, you know, wine, because it's not common. There's a huge tax on it because it's a, a, a Hindu community that doesn't drink. So he said, yeah, no, we'll hook you up and we'll, we'll do the event. So I expected, you know, a few people on the call. So we set up the wine so that I had the ice wine in front of me and whoever could buy it in India, which is not easy, would go and buy it. And I've done this a number of times during COVID. Do you know how many people, how many sommeliers? We're talking like professional people who serve wine. You got to think of the population in India. There's one point, what, four billion? Yeah. So all of a sudden they flipped me on and they said, Donald, by the way, we'd like you to realize there are eight thousand sommeliers listening to you on your presentation wow I'm like, there are i mean how do you get eight thousand people in a country like india I mean, it just it would never happen before i'd have to go and fly to india like i'd fly to every other country in the world as i did whether it was japan max would be 100 200 people sitting in an audience listening to me talk with the wine in front of them so as a tool i think it's good 
I agree with you. It's kind of disconnected us a bit, but I think you can see now from the problem they have at airports, everybody wants to get back into the game and go and visit somebody or relatives or go to another country. So I think you use them, you know, as they are a tool, but you got to go back. Society, I mean, we are, you know, societal animals. We just love to be around people. And I think that COVID has caused one negative, a lot of stress on people that are isolated, especially older people who were isolated. So I, like I said, I always look at the silver lining and hope that that's, you know, the way we look at the future. I mean, you watch this AI discussion. I think it's going to be fantastic. Uh, unfortunately, some people, some people are dwelling on the negativity, but we should hopefully do it intelligently. Well, in 1998, you were you were recognized for being a trailblazer in Canada's wine industry. The fact that the world recognized you first, and then Canada took <laughs> it took what like 12, 13 years to catch up. Uh, and you were recognized. <laughs> took a while. They, I find it kind of cute that, you know, uh, you know, we had to go to win this award. And then what I did was when, you know, when I put it here, you know, at $89 for a half bottle of ice wine, which, you know, I'll explain how it's made so people appreciate how expensive and how risky it is. It's probably more risky than investing in the stock market or crypto for that matter. And th the situation is that, you know, you, you've got to sort of commit to it and take the good with the bad. But going global to me was like natural because I couldn't get people convinced to buy it here. They said, are you crazy? We're going to pay that kind of price for a while. And it's sweet. We don't drink sweet wine. So this is not sweet one. This is an experience. And so when I went to Japan, which is the people that noticed the award in France the most, because at the time they were, and if you remember in the 90s, the Japanese, they bought Rockefeller Center in New York. They bought Pebble Beach yeah. in California. They were buying a lot of things. And they were coming to Niagara Falls. They were visiting, there was many of them. We had tours come down, JTB tours, all very organized as the Japanese are. Six buses had arrived at the winery here, which we are just literally 12, I'd say 12 kilometers downstream from Niagara Falls. And then I thought, wow, these people are just buying up all the, they were buying 65% of our sales of ice wine. So I jumped in an airplane and went to Japan. And I spent a lot of time in Japan cultivating the market. And again, from a business perspective, you have to be focused. If you're not focused, it's going to be tough to be successful, trying to do too many things at the same time. So I focused on Japan, got that built as a market. Then I went to Singapore, South Korea, Hong Kong, and then I went to China. That's a whole other story. That, that became a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> so those are the kinds of things that I'm, I'm hoping to uh, pass on to young people that want to get into business, whether it's wine or something else. There are certain key things that I've learned that had I known, you know, be more successful. I don't know how you measure that, but it would have been a lot less painful, let's put it that way, through trying it and failing and then trying it again. And this way here, hopefully we can share. And I might even think about I, somebody's, a couple of people have asked me to write a book. I might come and get some advice from you on how to do so. I'd like to write a book with my experiences as business advice. And I was, you know, always said, no, no, no. But I now have a nine-year-old son and he's quite the character. And now all of a sudden I'm thinking, you know, maybe I'm just gonna think about downloading my knowledge to him through this book so that he can share it with other people as well. But it's really kind of, given me a, a inspiration to do so with him in mind as being a young man that hopefully will grow up in this world that's changing but for him it'll be opportunities it's interesting that that you shared that with me because there was something that i explored and i work with a gentleman in toronto and my thought was this, all these people spend all this money on their succession planning and giving money away and putting a name on a building and all that stuff, which is great. So Don, I was sitting on the 69th floor of First Canadian and I asked myself a question, who built this building? 
And I knew because I'm old enough that it was the right twins. But then I looked over at Scotia Tower and all these other buildings. And I said, I don't know these people. And I'm sure they were pretty substantial. They, your father probably signed their papers to come over, but I don't know who they are, right? No one's going to remember they are. And then I started thinking about, well, who do I know? And I'm thinking, well, I my favorite book is Herman Hess, uh, Siddhartha. And I'm thinking that I know who Shakespeare is, and I know who Faulkner is, and I know who Emerson is. And I said, you know, it's more valuable maybe writing something that's significant so not just my kids and myself that it has the potential to live beyond me from the lessons i gleaned in this little this little short life and that's why i spent so much time and i spent a fortune on the editing i kept on every time i made changes i'm a writer i would hire a new proofreader and I had 11 people touch my book because I just wanted it to say that I was here. So, you know, a lot of people came to me and said, Peter, I'd love you to write. And I'm thinking, well, I don't, I'm an entrepreneur. I only write things that actually inspire me. And I don't write things that, you know, please, someone tells me what to write. I find something interesting. I want to explore it and put it into words. And... I then found someone who did biographies because I started thinking, I'm working with these really wealthy people. And I said, what's twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 to actually chrono chronological how they did it? And how did they actually, like, what was the mindset? And I'll just share with you one crazy s story. I knew a gentleman. He also had the Order of Canada. I remember no book was ever written on him. I did write, you know, for him, he was so giving to me. I wrote a eulogy for him but one time i came into his office and this was someone who actually popes and prime ministers and you know presidents he was one of the biggest builders and one of the most successful immigrants who ever came to canada and he came in very disheveled and i and i asked why george what, what's wrong he said i just saw a guy panhandling and i'm not good looking and an immigrant to this country and why did my life turn out like this and his life didn't because he had everything afforded to him in this beautiful country. And I then asked him a series of questions like, what, you know, what did you dream when you were a kid? And he dreamed building around the world. And we went through this whole discussion. And what came out of it for me is like, it was that he'd given me this gift that he had like this image and the world outside of him did not match that image. And I asked him, because he was 72 at the time, I said, did you, did that picture when you were, you know, a little kid and hungry, did, did you realize it? And he said, yes. And he had this big relief. And I'm thinking, that was the greatest gift that this man, who was worth like over a billion dollars, could have ever given me yeah. more than like, you know, giving me like a physical object or money to manage or whatever. It's like, he shared with me the inner workings. And this is what a donation of a building, or let's say if you, you know, had the department of, I don't know, like pharma, uh, um, uh, I'm lost right now, at Guelph, what they have no, something well, for uh, Well, we did, I did build uh, in a skill and all at Brock University. Okay, so, 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 right, so that's an example, but what got Donald, to do all these different things and insights. And I learned this a long time ago, Don, the difference between a biography and a memoir is this. A biography tells me, an autobiography tells me the chronological steps. A memoir is you're making a point and then using your, your experiences in your memory to go and solidify that point for the reader and more importantly, for yourself. Peter, that's very much what I f was hoping to do if I do this book. Now you're motivating me, to, sorry, inspiring me. I learned the other day with my friend Lance Secretan, who I'm doing this program with, I said to you, that motivation is, you know, paying somebody more money, giving them a bonus, etc. Inspiration is, I, 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 it's, the word speaks for itself when you inspire somebody. So I think what your point is that, you know, you want to inspire people by putting these things that you've experienced into writing so that you can share that with other people. 
and buying time because that's the one thing that makes humans different than all other species on this planet is I can learn from your experiences. I can, I don't have to directly experience what you've done, but I can take learning and apply it to my own life. And that is the beautiful thing about being human and your experiences. You were, you have a doctorate of laws from Brock University. Yeah, I've got a couple of them. So they, uh, you know, they were very kind to honor me with that. And what I always asked was, I said, this is really nice, but I want to be able to talk to the students. So I want to be able to come back to your school. They had done a Canadian business case, uh, Western, back in 1978, when we had decided whether or not we were going to build a new winery, which ironically, the result of the uh, MBA uh, course was that, nah, that's a really dumb idea to build a Canadian winery to make premium wine. Fortunately, before they published it, I got started on the new winery. So, <laughs> And uh, when you speak of Bank of Montreal, I have to tell you that I was on the 27th floor because some young Scotsman came to Canada, shows up over here while I got a hole in the ground where I just started to build a new winery. And my bank manager from another bank said, what are you doing? I just saw a uh, uh, purchase an agreement sale for a piece of land. Where are you going to get the money? I said, I'm going to get it from you. He said, you don't have any more money. We, you've, we've given you everything and we've got everything but the shirt off your back. This young Scotsman walks in with his vice president from the Bank of Montreal and says, look, we're here setting up commercial banking. You probably knew the division. Paul Holland was the president at the time. And he said, I'm here to help. And I'm like, yeah, right. You and the government are here to help. He gave me money at prime uh a quarter percent above prime with uh i forget the name of the paper and he said all i need is financial statements i'm thinking shit financial statements monthly i said i've never heard of that so i went and hired an accountant and said can you do this for me oh, yeah sure no problem no personal guarantee i was 23 years old <laughs> that guy i have a plaque that i put up on the vineyard he passed away with cancer became a good friend if it wasn't for that individual and people like General George Kitching, who gave us this license, I wouldn't be here. Inniskillen wouldn't be here. So it's always those individuals that you remember that helped you. And I want to turn that around and do the same thing for young people, because I got helped when I was in a desperate situation that I had nowhere to turn. I look back and try, try to figure out how I financed Inniskillen. I have no idea. I mean, I just relied on these individuals that assisted me, and we made it through. I want to follow that theme because I, I believe, especially for myself over the last two years, I've become a much more spiritual person where I've had incidents happen in my life that are beyond probability. That when I took one step forward, it seemed like magic just happened and the road just appeared. Are there moments in your life, because you're, you're sharing with me, there happens to be, where you were determined to do something and there was really no path. But it, at that point, when you were completely congruent, the right opportunities and the right people always showed up and there's sort of a magic. And I, before I focus on that, everyone likes focusing on Adam Smith in his book on capitalism, what they always fail to focus on is the invisible hand. And that to Adam Smith was God. That when you go and are congruent and you move towards something that's right, the right people and opportunities just show up. And if we can just, you know, highlight those moments in your life, because you've just shared a lot of this stuff shouldn't have happened. If this crazy 20 year old 23 year old kid like who was going to give this guy money and it just always seemed to happen where you were on a world stage in 1989 you know, I, think, I think i can quote another great philosopher yogi Berra, who said you know when you come to a crossroads pick one and i think that's fundamentally where people make a decision you know make a mistake you got to make a decision and then you're going to live with it and generally if you got the right gut feeling and you know you can use data which has now become the big buzzword you know and it helps because it gives you you know very sound information most of the time but you got to make a decision and run with it because if you waffle 
either you know somebody's going to pass you and take over your position or you're never going to do anything you're just going to sit there and try to think about it so you can't analyze forever make a decision and then you're right because whatever that path is it seems that somebody is there to assist you i have never heard anybody before i admire you for using the analogy that adam smith's the invisible hand is god i mean everybody thinks adam smith's a capitalist but you know the other guy at the extreme other end marx I think it was Adam Smith that said, you know, so, so socialism is a great idea, except it does come apart. Not unlike democracy right now is having a struggle. But, you know, there's two sides to democracy. There's, you know, the one that's the, you know, we had an incident here in Canada, up in Ottawa, when people wanted their freedom. Well, that's nice. But, you know, if you're in a democracy, you kind of have to play the game that, you know, if the majority wants to do certain things, if you want to do things individually, that's fine. You go ahead and do them. But don't impose that on me, which seems to be happening. You know, the left and the right. And my analogy with the left and the right extremists are, if you bend them into a circle, the extremists all end up in the same spot. So yeah. I think your, your point is really well taken. And people, as I said at the beginning, have to take uh, more, uh, I'll call it social responsibility, whether it's in the environment. Uh, you know, the tax issue is always a huge debate. But it's really people as individuals can make a difference. So many people think that, you know, their vote or their actions aren't going to be important. But that's how leaders become great leaders. You take a position and you lead. And that's the best thing you can do, lead by example. I have a question. So do you remember the moment you decided you were going to strike it out on your own and not work for anyone? I've never had that because I was born on a farm, my dad passed, I took over as the oldest son in an Italian family. So I, I never had to make that decision, believe it or not, except when we built this corporation called Vincor, we had 14 wineries in around the world. I think we were one of the large, 10 largest wineries in the world. And I, we were taken over in a hostile takeover. I thought, wow, this would be great. I'm gonna have the world's biggest wine company in the world as a platform. I lasted three months. That was the first time I walked out of a job because it just didn't didn't fit, didn't work. I just like making my own decisions. Sometimes they weren't always right. But as I said earlier, I surrounded myself with very smart people. I had a board of directors that often guided me. So I never had that difficult time. I know a lot of people these days, and that's why I like mentoring, uh, particularly a lot of women now are starting to start their own businesses. And, you know, they probably don't have the experience. You know, there's talk of a glass ceiling, but I've watched a lot of very talented women break that glass ceiling and enjoy breaking it. You lost your father at 15 years old. You've got this company that now you're running that's one of the largest wine producers in the world. You're top of the hill. And you realized that you had built yourself a gilded cage because you had always been an entrepreneur and you really didn't have to answer to anybody that you didn't choose to answer to and now you had stockholders and you had boards and there was a moment that you just you made a fundamental change in your life and could you, could you share that with us i was in ottawa and i was the master of ceremonies introducing the ottawa wine and food show and the uh, provincial minister, um, Jim Bradley spoke, the federal minister, uh, John Manley spoke. And then I, you know, introduced them, thanked them, everything. And I said, folks, you know, we're just before we open the uh, show, I have an announcement to make. What prompted this announcement was I was in the hotel and I was going downstairs to get, I don't know, razor blade to shave so I, I look presentable when I'm on stage. I didn't have a beard at the time. And I jump in the elevator and I see this guy and I look at him and I think, hmm. I said, I, I, I think, uh, sir, we have a mutual friend. And he said, uh, who's that? And I said, Jerry Schwartz. He goes, yeah. I said, I know Jerry Schwartz. He said, he's supposed to be here. Where is he? I said, I, I'm not sure. The guy I'm talking to is Michael Douglas, who, you know, is a famous actor. Michael Douglas was... He was there to attend an award being given to Lauren Michael. Oh, 
So, and he said, Jerry's supposed to join me. And I said, well, just a minute. So I grabbed the phone. I called Jerry and I said, Jerry, I'm standing here in front of a friend of yours, Michael Doug. He said, what the hell are you doing in Ottawa? I said, well, he just told me you're supposed to be here. And I said, well, I'm in Ottawa. And I said, I'm basically going to introduce, you know, this wine show. And I said, I'm really, he said, How, are you, you're still in the wine business? I said, yeah. He said, Donald, what are you doing there? He said, they don't deserve you. And like, uh, he caught me off guard and I handed the phone to, to uh, Michael Douglas. So I walk out to, you know, I went up, changed, went out to do my song and dance to open the show after these two ministers announced. And I said, ladies and gentlemen, before we go into the show, the place has got hundreds of people standing there, media, everybody's waiting to go into the show. And I said, I have one more announcement. There was only one other person that knew that I was going to do this because I would phoned and said, what do you think? I stood up and I said, ladies and gentlemen, I quit. <laughs> dead silence. And then I walked off the stage. That was it. That's how I did it. And then the next day we put a press release together and told the world. And what was that like, that change, that relief? Like, how did you feel after you said, I'm, because I'm going to step back. You <laughs> created a gilded cage for yourself, right? Like, because you created an incredible product and then you have to have this incredible industry behind you, like this, like you, this infrastructure. And then you became trapped and you gave yourself permission to leave it. But I got to tell you one thing, when you're up there and you're standing on a platform and I can relate to politicians and rock stars and movie stars, when you're no longer that person that identifies with, you know, I was, I was in a skillet. Carl, you know, he was great making the wine, but he didn't like to get out there in the public. So I was the face of in a So I'd hand people my card and go, Oh my God, in a Oh my God. They still do it. Then when I became not in a skill and I had a card that said Donald Zeraldo, just a blank white paper, Donald Zeraldo, nothing on it. I'd hand it to people and they'd say, what do you do? I'd say, I'm a farmer. And then they would walk away. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, all of a sudden I lost my identity. It took me a while to adjust, but thank God, because you know, otherwise I would have been doing that for the rest of my life. Probably thinking I was a really well-liked guy because of who I was, but in actual fact, a lot of it had to do with who I represented. And that was this guy who built this winery with all these other people who I didn't get to acknowledge. And the other thing I can share with you, I had no idea how important all of these people were that worked with me. And to this day, every opportunity that I get, I thank them because if it wasn't for them, I could have never pulled this off. Carl making the wine, Debbie Pratt, you know, PR, Don Grundy, my executive assistant, Gerald Close with the Vineyard. These people did all the work. I just stood up, did my little dog and pony show. And that's why I relate it to these situations where you see some of these, like, I mean, I don't know, I could name a few. They kind of disappear all of a sudden. And I'm not sure how they handle it. Football players, you know, athletes. It's a tough transition, but one that really awakens your inner spirit and when you mentioned about being more spiritual, I think that's where I went. I'm not a religious type. I was brought up a Catholic, Italian. You know, of course, I am oldest. I was going to be a priest for one at one time. I've become more Buddhist because I respect that integrity and respect of humans. Um, so my life changed dramatically. Now, the real focus in my life now is my nine-year-old son. That's everything to me. Everything else comes secondary. So it's, it's a real life changer. My respect for people who have work, single moms who work, I don't know how they do it because I know I would have never been able to spend the time making it a skill and a successful traveling around the world had I, you know, been committed to, a fa to raising a family and spending time with my family and my kids. So I, I greatly respect and honor people that can do that and, and be successful. It's quite a task. Well, what's really interesting what you're sharing, and I like to also bring it over to your son and, you know, how fortunate he is that you have had time to have lots of introspection. I became friends with a gentleman who was the first president of Starbucks, Howard Beard. And he went from when he joined, it had 17 stores. And when he left, it had 17,000 stores around the world. 
And in 2008, he completely stepped down. And he writes about this, so I can say this. He wrote about this in his book. It's, the, it's not about the coffee. Um, he laid in bed thinking, who am I? What am I going to do? Because he had been so associated with Starbucks. You know, he, he wasn't Howard Schultz, but there were three, just like you mentioned, there were three people in its success. Howard Schultz, that everybody knows, Orrin Smith, and Howard BR, and they, and in the world of coffee and the franchise, everyone knew, knew them. Howard Schultz was the front man. Yeah. And he had months where he had to figure out his identity and the way he worked through it is he realized I can share my life experiences. And now he teaches and he speaks on servant leadership and giving back. And that becomes really important. And many people, the reason I wrote my, my book is I was sitting with a lot of successful people in Toronto on Fridays. There'd be a place that we would just gather and some of the wealthiest people in the city. And I was reading all those books on male aging. And I think you and I sat down and I said mentorship because I started reading these books because I wanted to sell to really successful older men. And I got really depressed because I realized the only difference between them and me was time because I was going to become that guy who's going to watch Bambi and start crying because I never realized like how beautiful it was and how sad it was, right? Because I never allowed myself to have those moments. And in your life, you made a, a big choice that a lot of men wouldn't have made. You became a father after having this incredible trip and ride and how did that change you like I remember because I sat down with you when your wife was pregnant and I'm thinking this guy because I have a lot of kids this guy doesn't know what he's in for whatever whatever successes or whatever he's had like I had my last child at 41 and I'm 53 right now I knew what I was getting into and I realized I didn't have the same stamina I had when I had my first at 29. <laughs> I'm, uh, I was 63 when I had Aspen and uh, th th now there's nothing else. That, that, you know, the Inniskillen, that was my first baby and it was great, but it's now irrelevant somewhat because this is my life right now and I commit myself to him fully. Uh, I'm a single dad, unfortunately. But it does allow me the time, and I have not had a babysitter in four years. Every minute that I'm with that boy, I'm spending with him, totally focused on him. Nothing else distracts me. I, a wedding, I was at a wedding Saturday, and he was getting bored because there was no kids. And he said, Dad, can we leave? I said, sure. I pissed off everybody there because it was, you know, very good friends. I don't do weddings very often. <laughs> but as soon as he said he wants to go because he was bored, there was no kids around and people were saying things to him and he'd look at him and say, they said, oh, Aspen, how are you? I'm bored. <laughs> so, uh, no, it changed my life completely and it, it really gave me a purpose. So, you know, now when I speak to him, you know, he likes cooking because his grandpa's a chef. He loves to ski with me because that's one of my passions is, as you may know, is skiing. It kind of was a relief for me from, you know, the, the grind. And uh, so, you know, maybe he'll become a ski bum. Maybe he'll follow in my footsteps. That's why I did the Zeraldo Ice Wine, because it's our name. And if he chooses to do that, wonderful. If he chooses to be a ski bum or a chef or combine all three, which would be a good deal, um, that's to me what motivates me and inspires me these days. And also watching these young kids, you know, that technology, he had to go through that painful experience of doing school from home. Uh, during COVID, but the kid teaches me how to use technology, and to him, it's just a way of life. Like, you know, we had a telephone. But remember the day when we had to sit in the office and answer the phone that was plugged into the wall? Yes, <laughs> I, I could not be in San Diego working in Toronto without this technology. No, I, and I couldn't travel. A lot. I mean, I used to spend two hundred days a year traveling around the world tasting wine. Matter of fact, I'd show up at those places where you were hanging out after your uh, stock closed at 3.30. I was hanging out there so I could rub shoulders with these folks so they'd buy my wine because I knew they had all the money. <laughs> <And> so, <laughs> it was a purpose to my, uh, you know, being so social. 
And that's really changed. You're right. It's changed. And, you know, the young people, people say the world's in bad shape. I, I think it's just creating great opportunities for young people. They just need to know how to adapt, which they're much better at it than we are. You know, as we get uh, older, I hate to say this, I like hanging around with him because he keeps me young, keeps me mobile and thinking young, which is, I think, the secret to staying young. Well, that's that's definitely it's it's a proven fact that if you have children who are more de who are dependent on you, you, men stay more productive until they become independent longer. And that's one of the things that I discovered when I was doing that research for my last book, that we're interesting creatures because we, I, when we're young, we're pounding our chest. And at the end of our lives, we're like driving in the slow lane and we want to tell everyone a story because that's how we live on. And Donald, I'm looking forward to you writing your memoir because I think it's uniquely Canadian. It's in an industry that people have an interest in but they don't have a knowledge in and it's a human story so i don't it doesn't matter it's wine but the human story is the same story if you're a plumber everybody has a great story to share and life lessons and the beautiful thing about and you can appreciate this because you you've grown wine your entire out of life it's now you get to go to the vineyard and get those ripe grapes we just it turned uh, into something wonderful we just netted the uh ice wine grapes last week to get ready for the winter coming and uh but back to the book you've given me some uh, inspiration to to do it you know writing the book on ice wine or the anatomy of a winery which was basically to explain a little bit about canada because nobody ever heard of it and the likes of hugh johnson and Jancis robinson who were at you know write about wines they hadn't done canada because there's nothing that much to write about those were difficult but they were easy because i was just basically explaining the technique the process the vineyard the terroir the climate writing a book i always struggled between you know telling my story which you made that interesting distinction about an autobiography and a uh, memoir i always struggle with and i don't want to get too personal and brag about myself because i'd rather other people brag about what I did you know you don't want to blow your own horn too much especially being a Canadian and I always say to people you know you know we Canadians if we don't blow our own horn who the hell is it's what I love about Americans they are not shy like we are the greatest you know California they never took a second seat to uh, France and Italy matter of fact in the 76 um, uh, Jusman de Paris you remember Steve Spurrier from Decanter magazine he went to California discovered it and said, you know what, I'm going to take these back. And he had a tasting in France with all the experts. And lo and behold, Stag's Leap uh, Winery, Red Cabernet, placed ahead of the French. And Chateau Montalena from Napa, the best Chardonnay against the Burgundies. That woke up the whole world. So, you know, that kind of third-party endorsement is always what I'd relied on to promote us. And I try to, you know, also give Carl credit because... You know, he, he was always in the in behind the scenes, like you talked about uh, Starbucks and the whole team there. So I appreciate your uh, your guy. I'm going to get back to you on the book because you're going to have to help me with uh, with putting it together. Cause I've got pieces and chunks of it. I have no idea how to. Well, you've got good stories. So before we, because I'd like to have more conversations with you, because I think this could help you with your book. Is actually one of the reasons I'm having these interviews because I'm writing my next book and I'm calling it The Dot Collectors. And I'll give you the premise of that. Not connectors, collectors. Because you have to first collect experiences before you can connect those experiences for wisdom. But we're not isolated. We need other people because you have a perspective, I have a perspective, and together we could grow a useful map to survive. And that is what I'm looking at. And that's why I like having these discussions. So I want to have, you know, I, I would love to have more discussions with you on this, Don, because you have huge insight. But give me a really funny story of someone really famous. Because, you know, there's people who are going to be watching us and they're voyeurs. They want to know, well, you know, here's this guy. He's this big winery guy. He's like ice wine, world famous, got the Order of Canada, have several honorary doctors bestowed on them. Well, you mentioned the, uh, the 
the Mike Douglas. Is there anyone else? Like, I know, like I've seen some pictures with you with Dan Aykroyd. Uh, A lot Dan, of pictures uh, of you, Dan Aykroyd. <laughs> Good old Canadian boy, Dan. The last time I saw Dan, after he gave me the Queen's uh, Award, they picked him to give it to me because Queen couldn't make it because she was busy that day. And so I was at a cannabis conference because I became chairman of a cannabis company for a short period of time. I grew the stuff at university. It was part of my uh, agricultural research back in the 70s. <laughs> That's how I got to be popular. I hear I thought it was because I was quarterback of the football team. It had to be, instead it was, I had a bag of marijuana from the greenhouse. And I had a bunch of wine from my, my home. But Dan, uh, I don't know how he called me. I was at this conference. He may have heard that I was speaking at the conference in California. And he called. He said, you got to, on the way home, why don't you come to Oregon where we have a farm? So him and, and uh, Belushi have an, a marijuana farm in Oregon. And they said, would you come up because we want to do a little skit with you. Jim's doing a, a marijuana program a feature. And his storyline is, if my brother would have been smoking marijuana instead of doing whatever other drugs he was doing, he'd still be alive. So I go to the farm. They're having this big party. It's a ranch they have. And they, they grow Afghan marijuana, selected carefully and imported into the United States. I'm sure it was imported legally. Uh, and so Ackroyd and I, you know, became buddies. And, you know, he did get in the wine business here for a while. And I've been actually, I was trying to reach him recently. Um uh, because, you know, he's got this skull vodka. So, yeah, and the one thing about wine, you know, to me, you know, Dan's a famous actor. And I probably could think of a lot of other famous people. But to me, the famous people that really were inspirational to me were people like Robert Mondavi. You know, he's the guy who reinvented the California wine industry that took on the Europeans. Uh, Piero Antinori, Marchese Piero Antinori. You know, 600 years in the wine business, their family are bankers. He owned 10,000 hectares in Tuscany. These people shared all of their knowledge and their attitude was, I'm an artist. You want to be an artist? I'll share with you everything I know. Good luck. If you can be as good as I am, that's up to you. They had no secrets because there are no secrets in the wine business. But it's people like that that are inspirational because they're not hiding anything. They don't patent anything because what, what sort of patent, you know? So those are the people that I really look up to that I always tried to hang out with because I got a lot of inspiration. The celebrities, they served a purpose. You know, when you're doing something with a celebrity, whether it was, uh, you know, in New York, uh, Peter Jennings, who's Canadian, or who's the guy that uh, ran the music for um, Letterman, Canadian, Paul. Oh, Paul Schaefer from Paul Schaefer. Sudbury. And, they, and, and I want to ask you, they can't, Probably can they grow wine up in Sudbury? Is that no, possible? Absolutely <laughs> not. They try it. They try it. So <laughs> people like that, I mean, I hate to say it, but you know, I'd hang around with them because they were famous. And if I was hanging around with them, people here in a skill and, and they go, What the hell's that about? And then, you know, so it served the purpose. Uh so using their uh, celebrity status and hopefully, and many of them do use that platform to do good things for the for yeah. the, the world. Well, this has been great, Don. I want to thank you so much for spending this hour with me and I look forward to doing it again. And you know what I'm looking forward to actually talking in the future about your memoir. I'm looking forward to coming down. I got to get back down to California. I was just, I just did an interview with Jean Charles Boisset, a uh, young French, young French, he's a Frenchman. And he decided to marry a young lady called Gina Gallo, who, you know, everybody knows in California. And uh, I was down there and they did, we did an interview on his Instagram and uh, it was a riot. We did it for, I don't know, 30 minutes, but we had a joint venture here in Canada together. We did a, a joint venture called Clos Jardin and it was joining the French uh, knowledge in Chardonnay and Pinot Noir with the Canadian similar climate in this microclimate that we have. So we just did that. And that was my first time back in California for 10 years. So I'm due again, to come back. And I want to get somebody to do my distribution. So here, I'm still working. I'm playing the game. So I'm going to come and visit you. I'll bring some wine and uh, we'll have great. a great chat. You know the Georgias. I can treat you like a tourist. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I'll come back to Canada. You can take me to the, of, uh, <laughs> the Sky Tower. 
Yeah, Niagara, it's, Falls. I know, Niagara Falls. Yeah, well, I'll treat you a <laughs> tourist. How's that? <laughs> Peter, it's been great well, fun. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Don. And we'll, we'll definitely talk. Ciao. I wish I had a glass of wine to toast you with, but next time. And the greatest healer for anybody later on in life is to mentor younger people. I, and I find this all the time. I sit down with uh, business owners all the time and they always give me unsolicited advice because they want to share their knowledge. And it's really important. Here with me is Peter Merrick, President of Merrick Wealth income and capital enhancement consultant, speaker, and author. He is also a recognized expert in the world of succession planning. There's over 800 published articles and three industry textbooks. He's a Canadian who joined us today from San Diego, California. Thanks for joining us. So, Peter Merrick, tell us about you. Well, I've been in the financial service industry since the end of 1991. I graduated during the recession. The baby boomers were in their positions, so there was no jobs. So the two businesses that opened up were the technology field and the financial field. It was the Wild West in both of them. So I had this brilliant idea, and I had a friend of mine, and we started talking, and I said, hey, how difficult would it be for us to get a mutual fund dealer license? Not difficult enough. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God for those 10 years, the market just went up. I would sit down and I would take somebody's entire life savings that they spent 15, 20 years accumulating it, this young kid who knew nothing about nothing, and I would go and just invest it. And luckily it went up because the markets were crazy in the 90s. It was a boom time. But in 2004, my life blew up. I almost went bankrupt, but I was very fortunate because there were very few CFPs at the time, but every university in Canada wanted to offer the CFP program. So I got recruited as a prof. And it was great. I was reading all the textbooks. I would call all the big publishers. And what I came to the conclusion was the succession planning was missing. One of the issues was is there was very little talking beyond the accumulation stage. Like, how do you have a healthy life after you've done that? I also looked at demographics. At the turn of the 20th century, the average life expectancy in the West and North America was 43 years old and people are dying at 83. No one ever lived 83. Well, you know, so I always say that there's two financial plans. There's a financial one that we work on, and there's a what you get to do with all your time and that energy once you're done. And with this thing that they've been racing towards, they've hit it. But if they haven't thought about what they're gonna do after or how they're gonna feel validation for their existence, they just never stop. They just keep going. Well, it's not anybody's fault because when people are young, they focus too much on doing and later on in life, they have to focus on being. So I wrote my own textbooks because I thought it was very important to talk about how do you transition from the first half of life, which Carl Jung called it the morning, mm -hmm. where you're accumulating, whether it's your ego, yep. designations, education, houses. The second half is deconstruction, giving wisdom away, giving away my money, giving away my time, leaving a legacy. So talk to me about that stage. What's the purposeful way or kind of the best practices, ways, or considerations for people to take when transitioning into that stage of life? Well, one, decide whether or not you want an exit. I find between the ages of 55 and 70, a lot of people feel that I'm just tired doing the same thing that I've always done, and I have the money now. So maybe I should get out when the going is good and pass on my business to someone who's got the energy to navigate it. Number two, who are you going to sell your business to? 
There's one issue about selling it to a family member or an employee. What happens after you sell it? Things don't go right. A lot of business owners want to sell their business because they just want to wash their hands. But by selling it to someone you know, you're not getting out of your business. The best is to sell to a third-party purchaser. The last one is after they make that transition from being a business owner, building a nest egg for themselves to have choice, they don't know what they're going to do. I've spoken to people who say, you know, I'm going to take up golf. So my question is, do you golf now? I don't golf now. So what makes you think you're going to golf later? I just want to share with you guys a story. There was a gentleman whose name was Bob Hunter. He was quite a celebrity. He started Greenpeace during the height of my blow up when I was going through business loss. He was bringing me on national television. And you know what he was doing? He was saying, so Peter, don't you do that? And then he would give my phone number and he would give my uh, web address. The reason why I went by MerrickWealth.com because it was almost like a phone number that would run across the television and I could actually see myself making money off of it. And he was dying. He had prostate cancer. And he turned to me and said, Peter, one day you will be in a position that you'll help someone else. And let me share with you about the legacy. Bob's been dead for 16 years and I'm sharing you the legacy of Bob Hunter because he made a difference for me and if I make a difference in anyone else's life I'm a product of those people who are willing to do things and they had no expectations and the true mentor is someone who has no expectations that they're going to see the tree blossom. The reason I wrote The King of Main Street is younger people don't know how to find the right mentors and older That's people nice. have this need to mentor it's almost like a biological need because they can see beyond their physical existence. They know that the sun was here before them and it will be after them yeah. and what's going to be left behind that they leave. I would joke, I can't make you money, but I can definitely save you money. What I mean by that is I am a Sherpa. That's someone who would guide someone to help them come down. But I realize the most precious asset they have is not their money. It's their time. What last piece of advice would you like to give our listeners? If you have a business, the most important thing to ask yourself is why did you get into the business? And it's usually not to create a legacy, it's to create the lifestyle that you want. And at that point, ask yourself, what do you want to do during your last days? The last human freedom is to choose one's own beliefs, one's own way. Everything else you can have taken away from you what you believe and how you choose to act in the world that is yours and the greatest healer for anybody later on in life is to mentor younger people and that is going to give you fulfillment emotionally spiritually and mentally you guys have been wonderful and i want to thank you and i hope you guys have a great day thank you